Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Currency of Anarchy. My name is Josh Davis. If you'd like to watch our uh, live shows, you can go to youtube.com slash user slash per of anarchy live Mondays at 9 o'clock Eastern, 6 p.m. Pacific. And if you'd like to check out the final products, you can find that at voluntary virtues at youtube.com slash slash user slash voluntary virtues. And um, if you'd like to comment on our products uh, while we're on the air, uh, you can do that at our Facebook group, and that is facebook.com slash groups slash Kerr of Anarchy. So um, I've got uh, Kika Houston. How are you, Kika? Doing wonderful. <laughs> how are you? <laughs> and uh, Corey Hastings, how are you, Corey? Hey, what's up? Hey, what's up? All right, so um, yeah, the first thing uh, that I guess we're going to talk about tonight is about property rights, land ownership. How would that be? How would that look in anarchism? And uh, that is because Kika posted this to a group uh, today, and I was like, "Ooh, that sounds good." So um, you know, we all have different theories of how this would look in anarchism, but. Um, my theory basically just comes from um, uh, if you live on the land, it becomes your land, uh, you know, it, within reason. Um, it, and it has to do with, uh, I forget the actual term because I'm smart, um, but basically it, banks would not own it first and then sell it to you. It, that just doesn't make any sense. How do they have a claim? Uh, you can't claim something that you're not using. Basically, you're, you're talking about people. homesteading. Homesteading. Thank you. Yeah, that's yeah. What we're it's, it's basically you know the idea of uh, exclusive use. That's property. Like you have exclusive use over whatever it is. It doesn't have to be land. So uh, that's where my theory comes in. That's just the basic form of what I've got. But Kika, I assume that you had uh, a theory of your own. You posed the question in the first place, so I'll drop it to you. Oh, well, I want to ask a question first. Um, yeah. What did you mean by uh, that you have to be using your property to own it, to have it? What do you, what do you mean by that? Okay. Uh, basically, someone could own a piece of property right. uh, or land if... Uh, they're renting it out but maintaining it oh. so um, they're the ones owning it because you know they have the responsibility oh. you know with freedom comes responsibility so that's what I'm thinking about um, so you could rent it out you could right. w live on it you could work on it uh, you know just uh, you have a field or you have an office building you're working uh, and maintaining that building for example um, you could own the whole freaking building and be using it like a, a factory. So um, I guess there are multiple ways that I'm seeing this ownership. Um, you don't just give it up if you leave. Um, okay, yeah, I, I wanted to clarify that because it, it sounded sounded to me like you were getting a bit of a commie attitude. No, I'm just kidding. No, of course not. <laughs> but, but no, oh. the, to define property rights as uh, owning something specifically because you're using it, it's kind of contradictory to to, uh, to freedom. If you have something in your possession or you own property, you can use it whenever you want because it's yours, whether you're using it, you know, like tilling land or, you know, owning a building and maintaining it, or if you're not and you're just um, paying the bills for somebody else to do it per se or, or something like that. If you're not directly involved in the ownership of your property, that doesn't mean it negates your ownership. Agreed. Okay. That's what I wanted to clarify before I got started. Because <laughs> uh, it didn't make sense to me at first, but I got it now. Anyway, the, uh, I'll, I'll go over the questions I posed earlier. Um, uh, so uh, I'm, I, I recently came under the understanding of uh, uh, nihilism, and I, I didn't realize I was a nihilist before I, I, reali I realized it, I guess I could say. Um, but I had kind of the same philosophy uh, based on my own spiritual experience. But before I understood nihilism, 
I was uh, more of an anarcho-capitalist. And I had two questions that I've been trying to figure out on um, uh, property rights and how a society involved in any anarchist philosophy would expand. And uh, my questions were, if two parties have a claim on property slash land, both with their varying legitimized opinions or contracts, how would this be resolved? And the second question was, how would a society expand if preference is constantly thrown around? Would it be market-based? Um, and then I got a bunch of, you know, either trolling comments or uh, various uh, opinions and stuff like that. One of them, which was actually uh, made the most sense to me, was uh, mutual benefit. So if, if you get into an, ar an argument with somebody who owns land and you're making a claim over it yourself, um, basically a compromise needs to be figured out for you to benefit, for this other person to benefit. Maybe you share a portion of the land with them, or you buy the land from them, or you conquer them, worst case scenario, and you're less reliable because you're violent. So, uh, Other ones, other comments had to do with um, strictly preference-based analysis, um, but it would still be market-based. So, But yeah, any any theories you guys have to add to that? Um, I, I had a similar question posed to me uh, a, about a week or so ago, and my response was that um, if two people are both making the same claim on the same land, then... Or property one, in general, I would say. Anybody can claim land or property. It's kind of the same thing. But if two people make a claim on the same thing, if there's no, like, witnesses, for instance, how would you go about, you know, dividing yeah, uh, Obviously, this, there this, is, this is what I was going to, uh, I was about to address, is if, if there is no, um, if there's no way to prove who had the claim on the land first, then whichever person who had invested in the land the most at that time, I would say, would be the legitimate claim on the land. If you've already invested in developing the land and the other person hasn't, then you have a, you have a monetary uh, value-based claim on that land. And if they're trying to take that land that you've already invested in, then they need to, uh, if they want to gain that land, they need to repay you uh, the value that you've already invested. I agree with you, Corey, in, uh, in practicality, in morality, I, or in our present day, I say, who cares? Because we're not there yet, and the market's going to figure it out. That's all I'm saying. I don't. I don't claim to know. For for anything, for literally anything that we plan on talking about tonight, I can guarantee you we're not there yet. Oh yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> you know that's that's yeah. kind of a redundant issue. But um, what I, I'm saying is um, you know, if, if you're if you're making a claim on someone's land or or two people are making a claim on the same land, but one person has already invested, you know, even, even if both people have invested in it already, if one person has invested more than the other, whether monetarily or, you know, in labor or whatever, if one person has invested more than the other in the land that is in question, then that person has the legitimate claim on the land. And for the other person to gain a legitimate claim on the land, they have to either repay that investment or, you know, mm -hmm. or show that they've invested more. Yeah. And if you if you can't do that, then you you don't have a legitimate claim on the land. Yeah, that's uh, almost it's, it's it's like it, it's like you're stealing from them. If if I've invested five million dollars into this you know this nice big property and I plan to build an airport there, I've already hired contractors to architects and engineers and all this stuff to build this airport for me, and suddenly you come and just build a house there, you know a twenty thousand dollar house when I've invested five million dollars in this property already, 
uh, clearly, I think I would have a legitimate claim on that property. And now, now not only what I've already invested five million, but now I need to hire you know arbitrators, you know to to determine that your building a house there is illegitimate. You have no right to own there because I've invested in the property. And now, not only that, but I also have to tear your house down. That's going to cost me money. And repair whatever damage you've done to the land, that might affect, you know, what I've already planned to build there. I, I, I don't but think it's if, enough to just... I you're reliable yeah. for those damages. You know, you, you've caused me monetary damages. I don't think it's enough to just make the claim that uh, I've invested. I think it's enough, or you you should be giving notice as well, because why would you invest without making any or building anything yet? You know, like people are just going to well, okay. lock their house down, like you said. We, so, we went into this debate also, and uh, the simple answer to that was, that if if you've already invested in building on a property, it's a pretty thing. It's a pretty simple fucking concept to, that you would put up a fence or something, and you know put some tape on it and say, "Hey, this property is the future location of Corey's International Airport. You can't build here." You know. Seems like a seems like pretty obvious answers, of course, but. Yeah. Uh, I mean, if if you if you roll up to a property, you look in to build a house, and there's a fence around this area saying that this is a lo future location of uh, you know Bob's hunting and tackle or whatever. Are you just gonna you know just tear down the tape and be like, oh fuck Bob, I'm just gonna build a house here? Well, really, that yeah. doesn't seem like enough. Only for the fact that um, I. Uh, I used to live in Salem, Mass, and there was this future pizza joint coming into uh, near um, Collins Cove. Uh, anyway, uh, there was a, a building there, and there was a sign-up, but it was there for like two or three years, and nobody was doing anything with this. I was like, well, is this a fake sign? This doesn't make any sense. It, it didn't... Yeah. Um, helped the market that he was just holding that. Uh, but at the same time, yes, he was saving up probably, whoever this owner is. He was probably saving up for it, but it's not enough because he, he just made a claim to it, and that's really not necessarily fair to the rest of the market. Well, well, what he would have to do is he would have to, uh, he would have to prove that he's actually put an investment if you know, if he's just claimed the property and he hasn't actually put any investment into it, then it's an illegitimate claim. But if yeah. if you if you claim the property and you actually put an investment into it, whether that's monetary, uh, whether you're hiring people to do it, or whether you're you know uh, legitimately uh, using your labor to build something on that property. Then you—that's a legitimate investment. But just this is because you put a sign there, that—that's not a legitimate investment. Right. So I'm saying there's something. Uh, there's got to be some kind of, unfortunately, almost governmental agency to uh, give out title. You know uh, what I'm I don't know about giving out a title. Uh, this would be like uh, if you're going to claim that land, that is basically a lodial title right there. Um, and so what we're saying is, uh, if um, if the group, the commune, is what you're basically saying, um, if the commune doesn't agree that that's a legitimate claim, then it's revoked. So the titles. Revoked is what we're saying. Well, now you're talking about communism. Well, that's that's what it sounds like from over from what I'm hearing, because you're like, well, who's going to make the um, who's going to make the claim that you do not have claim on that land if you just have a sign up? 
I'm, that's what I'm saying because it yeah, sounds that, government. Yeah, that makes it more complicated. I, I can see where you're going with that. Um, uh, there's there's several different ways you could do that. Um, you could have uh, DROs, dispute resolution organizations, that would you know they would look at you know the evidence and you know who made the claim when, and you know who invested the most into it if the claims were made at a, a close enough time to make it disputable or if someone had already lived there for several years and obviously they're the property owners you know all these things could come into effect and you would you would just have an outside arbitrator that has no in interest whatsoever in the property that would determine who would be the legitimate owner right that's one option I think one thing to consider too is the, for instance, from uh, Josh's uh, Pizza Hut story or whatever, the pizza shop story. It's going to take a lot less time for um, a, a business to get started, I, I believe, in an anarchist society of, of any sort, because there's no government to regulate safety codes or food codes yeah. or whatever bullshit you have to go through in a government system to get your business up and running. So Getting a business license. Yeah, for some years that it took, it's probably going to take months tops to get his business started the way he wants to. And then not even months; it would take like maybe a week. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I mean, what, whatever figure, but and then after that, based on any bad sales or bad rep he gains, is how his business you know makes it or, or doesn't make it. Um, yeah. Related to food codes or you know building codes, that kind of shit. If his building's obviously not up to smack, it's going to crash and kill people, and they're going to be less. Um, Less interested in going to a dangerous building, you know. Same thing with food. Uh, so you don't right. have any stupid restrictions. You keep your business going much quicker, much more quickly. Yeah, and when it comes to uh, uh, proprietors versus corporations, this is going to be much more liability on the proprietor because there will be no corporation. Uh, so in that sense, it's actually easier to start up. Also, in that sense, because um, Right now, you have to pay a city government at least 25 bucks. For me, it was 25 bucks as a proprietor. As a corporation in Massachusetts, you have to start up with 500. Um, that it's just another, you know, add-on right, is all right. I'm saying. Fees, time limits, etc. I mean, it just lengthens out the process to get a business started in America or anywhere mm -hmm. with that has a government that needs to get their cut before we start right. our shit. Well, that's really interesting about land ownership uh, because um, I've been thinking about the fact that this is like a, a it's a fee simple system that we have right now. It's feudalism, basically, just down, you know, a little watered down. Uh, it's not a loyal title. We do not have title to the land. Uh, the government does, so yeah. that's how they can that, tell us what to do. Well, that that's how they enforce the uh, eminent domain laws, where you know. They can basically they can just take your land basically at any time that they want, you know. And right. That's eminent domain if you look into those laws and uh, uh, those the same the same uh, laws that uh, enable them uh, to to use eminent domain to take your laws. Those are the exact same laws that enable those uh, uh, what are they called uh, oh asset forfeitures. If you look into asset forfeiture laws. The, it's the same thing. They they just take your property, and there's nothing you can do about it. Yeah, civil forfeiture they call it. Yeah, yeah civil forfeiture, asset forfeiture is. It goes yeah. by different names in different areas. Sometimes they call it civil asset forfeiture, but, but whatever. Um, it's the same fucking thing, and it's all enabled under eminent domain. Right. They just take your property, and they say, "Well, this is ours now. Ain't yeah. shit you can do about it." You know, and it's because uh, uh, technically you never own your property. You never really own it. You're right. renting it from the government. Yeah, that's where property taxes come in um, yep. because you're taxes. literally renting it out. Yep. Right. Property taxes, eminent domain, civil asset forfeiture is it all? It all falls under em eminent domain. Where basically eminent domain means that the government owns everything. You never really own anything, no matter what. 
Right. And this is, that's kind of the primary reason why I uh, why I decided to ask these questions on the, the group um, that a few of us are involved in. Uh, because it, hypothetically, if you get to a point where society is about to encroach on somebody else's land, whether they own a small one-acre plot and they just forage for shit outside of their land, or they own acres upon acres and they have you know herds of cattle and you know etc. When you begin to encroach on somebody's land uh, in that fashion, you have to decide if you're going to take their land over and establish some sort of extortionist philosophy on them like we have now, for instance, or are you going to overthrow their whole operation, conquer them, kill them, whatever you're going to do, and start fresh? That's kind of how America began, in a nutshell. Yeah. Right. Yeah, so, so that, that's how it started with the Native Americans. You just go, just conquer them, kill them, raise their children, pillage their villages, and just claim, hey, this is my land now. Speaking That's of how the governments do things, man. That's not how anarchists do things. Right, right. right. But I, I pose these questions because I wanted to. I wanted to find out if there. I mean, obviously there are market-based solutions, um, and, and such. But I wanted to 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 ask these questions because the group that I asked this on is involved in some heavy doses of nihilism going around. Ni yeah, nihilism. Excuse me. And uh, yeah. I, I wanted to. I want, I'm wanting to understand anarchism, anarcho-capitalism, and nihilism as, as much as I can, so I don't fuck up in any arguments, um, per se. Uh, I would say, personally, from my opinion, that um, the nihilism is more, to, uh, it, it seems more like a, the way that the government deals with things. You know, there is no right and wrong as long as you are more powerful. Right. That's what the government seems to do. That's what that's what nihilism is, you know, advocating is that well, there is nothing's morally right, nothing's morally wrong. If you're more powerful than whatever you do, you know, is is right in your opinion, so nothing's wrong. Well, I, I think that I don't think the thing is. Um, I think it justifies what they do. I think. Yeah. Some they, people they use nihilism to justify what they do. Uh, the thing is, I think they have a different uh, a code within them. It's just different for each individual. That's nihilism, but it it unfortunately justifies the government. It's I I think that a lot of nihilists still have right and wrong embedded within them. Uh, they just see things differently in a sense and but that's where I disagree with them because it's evident in nature that natural law exists you can't uh, take away natural law it's there you know it's within us and that's if we why, uh, because it well, that's that's why I I um, I've been saying that you know uh, Objective morality, really, it does exist, but it's it's uh, based on your species in natural law. Uh, on, under natural law, a lion will always protect their cubs. Now, let's under natural let's law. Involve animals in, in in adopting morality. That's just going to bungle the whole conversation. I'm not to mention nihilism in general. Talking about it right now is just going to screw this whole conversation up. Are arguing for nihilism and attributing. Uh, uh, appeal to nature, and I'm not. You can. I don't give a shit. Believe whatever you want related to morals, but getting into an argument like this and starting using definitions, whether your own or whether legit from the dictionary, definitions of objective morality, subjective morality, or any sort of morality, is impossible. You can't do this unless there's going to be like a, a serious, in-depth conversation where there's no trolling. And I don't have to this is why I, I hate talking about nihilism. I, I absolutely hate it. Um, I, I don't believe in nihilism. I never will, and I hate talking about it. Okay. <laughs> every, every time we start talking about nihilism, it just, you know, it, it goes downhill from there. Right, right. Uh, right. That's fine. Um, all I'm, yeah. All I'm saying is that's where it comes from for me. Cool. And, and I, I think that I think nihilism, uh, the belief in it, uh, 
it it authorizes everything that the government does, and that's you know that's what the the entire government bases their you know the way that they function is on nihilism. It's not wrong if we do it because we're more powerful. You know. Right. All right. So uh, let's uh, move on from it, I guess. Um, all right. So this still kind of uh, goes along with the whole idea, but let's talk about um, beliefs. Like and believing in something uh, blindly in a way uh, versus the truth. Like, uh, let's talk about uh, truth versus false or that kind of thing. Because um, I guess what I'm saying is, the more you research things, the more logical you try to be, uh, the more you're going to shed the beliefs of the system that we have right now. And uh, I I see a lot of you know I, I see a lot of parallels with morality in that sense, but um, I, I my thing is uh, I developed you know, you know I've always been interested in math and science and this kind of thing, so I've been interested in logic and I'm a programmer and you know so I'm always interested in what's right you know just blatantly what's right and um, so once I you know, got out of college, I got interested in libertarianism and minarchism, and um, then, you know, I got into anarcho-communism, uh, anarcho-capitalism. I, I was actually a little interested in anarcho-communism for about a day or two. Um, <laughs> it didn't yeah, take much. Was. that wrong, huh? <laughs> so, uh, but yeah, it, that doesn't make sense. It's, it doesn't go along with Morality, you know, if you're, um, if, if you you're don't an have the, right to the property of, if you don't have the property rights uh, to the product of your labor, you don't have rights to anything, really. Right. You're a slave. So, but what I'm saying is, um, if you're, um, if you're believing in a system. It's a system. A system just in the end doesn't work. It doesn't matter what kind of system. It's like gambling. If you have a system with craps, you're never going to win in the long run. Uh, it's you're you're playing with people's lives in this case, government. Um, so once you shed those beliefs that a, a government can actually work, um, it, it creates more problems than it uh, than anarchism would. I mean, anarchism is not a utopia. It's it's just believing in nature. Nature is going to take its course. Um, well, life, um, what it is. What what I always tell people, I, I get this argument all the fucking time, all the time, where people say, "Well, that's just utopian, or that's idealistic, or you yeah. know, whatever." It's precisely. And I tell them. I tell them every single time. I tell them the same thing. If if your idea of a utopia is not utopian, then you need to rethink your idea of utopia. You know? Right. And, or or why, why are you advocating for a society that is not utopian? If, if you know for a fact that you're advocating for a society that's not utopian, then you're advocating for something that you know is evil, you know is hurting people, uh, you know is, you know is harming people, why? Why would you advocate such a thing? You know, well, are you, are you asking you know? me directly? Because no, no, not no. I'm not asking you. I mean, this is a response that I give to people when they say oh, that right. anarchy is utopian. That's what I tell them. I'm, you know, you're you're criticizing me for advocating utopia, and yet you are knowingly advocating something that you know is not utopia. Mm. You know. What's wrong with you? You're you you think that I'm doing something wrong. What's wrong with you? Why would you advocate for something that you know is hurting people? Uh, yeah, Kiko, what do you think? Well, I think everybody should. I, it seems kind of counterproductive for anybody to argue against the utopian concept in general. Um, if everybody wants the best for themselves, they will are most. I, I, I would guess most likely always, unless they're completely brainwashed, argue for freedom-based ideologies, as everybody wants to be able to do what they want to do within their means or, you know, as best as they can. Um, 
just makes sense. That doesn't it doesn't correlate as being utopian. That's just realistic. It's unrealistic to believe that we can let government and uh, social orders run rampant and ruin freedoms um, and, and make everything impossible for people who want to be free and, and free of these controls. Um, leave them proliferating. It, it doesn't and you know, some people might equate this to you know justification and stuff like that. It being unjust to do these things, but um, much like the arguments for morality related to anarcho-capitalism, communism, it. I mean, it, that's where subjectivity comes into it. But like I said, whole other story. Yeah, I I find it much more, you know, uh, morally. Uh, morally just for me to advocate for utopia than for someone to advocate against utopia. I mean, if, if you think that my ideals are utopian, then don't you think that you should also be advocating the same ideals? Right. Well, the, the thing is with me, I, I don't see anarchism as a utopia. Because oh, I, don't, I don't either. But. Listen, listen, well, listen, the whole thing is if people believe in something like uh, and blindly, then that is basically utopian because they're hoping that, that people will change 100 percent. You know, the, the new social man or whatever. Um, what I'm looking for is people to be themselves. I'm not asking anybody to change at all. It's not utopian. It's just it's a different um, macrocosm as opposed to a microcosm. So it's well, not my, my my idea of uh, an anarchist society. Um, I don't believe that it will ever be utopian. Obviously, you know, people right. there are bad people out there, and there always will be. But at the same time. I am advocating for what I believe is a better society uh, with a better structure without the use of force from government and I do advocate that everyone in that society should abide by the non-aggression principle they shouldn't hurt anyone they shouldn't violate anyone's rights so uh, by advocating anarchy I'm not advocating utopia but at the same time on a, on a larger level, I do advocate utopia. I wish everyone would be better people and not hurt anyone else and not aggress on anyone else. So I do advocate for utopia, and I, I would argue that if you do not advocate for utopia, then there's something fucking wrong with you, you know? Don't, don't you think that everybody should, you know, abide the non-aggression principle? Don't you... Don't right. you think that people people who have the means to give to charity should help those who who don't have the means to you know get along by themselves? Yeah, they they yeah. should, and actually they will, uh, because they'll have the ability, and they won't have the burden of thirty percent of their income stolen by the government to pay for whatever the government wants. Exactly, multi-trillion dollar wars and all this other shit that right. doesn't need to happen. What you I'm know, saying. There'd be a lot more disposable income floating around if the government wasn't spending it on wars and killing people. Yeah. So. So yeah, right, I, I do thing. advocate utopia, but yeah. not you know I don't believe that anarchy alone by itself is utopia. But I, yeah. I do advocate utopia. So I agree with what you're saying, but at the same time. You're saying people should uh, abide by the non-aggression principle. I agree with that. Will people? Most likely not. But most over well, time, people, I think right? that a lot of over time, I think people will change. I think people will evolve because they'll be free. They'll be they'll change because the environment will have been freed. The environment will yeah. be changed. I, well, it's it's a it's common knowledge, you know. If you look throughout history, the more free a society is, the uh, the less violence and aggression that there is in that society. Precisely. So if if people are are completely free, as long as they're not violating, you know, the rights of other people, 
then they will be a lot more aggressive and a lot more violent towards their neighbors. Right. Especially, you know, if they know that their neighbors are able to defend themselves without, you know, government, you know, intervention in that sector also. Right. I think there would be a lot more based on the uh, the idea of a utopian anarchist society. I think there would be a lot more um, incentive to create a sort of utopia, you know, through means of charity. I don't think it would just be that people would inherently want to do that. I think it would just be incentive based because nobody wants to see um, homeless people stricken on the streets or, you know, people dying from disease all over the place. It wouldn't be like, you know, a, a, an anarchist pirate society where there's no fucking medicine because all the governments are against them kind of thing. Um, right. It would be all incentive-based. People would, people would have the, uh, uh, what am I saying? I mean, you, you guys kind of get the gist. Yeah, they have the resources. Yeah, they the resources would be available the much more effectively than it would per government intrusion. Yeah. I, I got in this argument um I got in this argument with my brother last night and he was arguing against anarchism. He was saying, Well, you know, I, I have a ten year old daughter and you know I don't want all these crackheads standing around the corner selling drugs <laughs> to my ten year old daughter, you know, just because, you know, they oh all of a sudden all the drugs are legal. And yeah, well, anarchy I, means more crackheads. Well, I my response to him was, well, you know, <laughs> drug laws has never stopped people from selling drugs before, and I don't see any crackheads standing around on the street selling drugs to ten year old kids anyway. And if they did, if you if you believe that this guy is endangering your family, you know, wouldn't you beat the shit out of him or something? You know, you know something. You wouldn't just let this guy sell drugs to your ten-year-old daughter. Well, you might you might get apprehended by DROs. Yeah, yeah, and and then you would argue you would argue in court. Okay, he's selling crack to my ten-year-old daughter, and yeah, so yes, I did beat his ass. He's endangering my family. You know. I think you're forgetting that like uh, there would be owners of roads, so they would manage those. Roads and get those druggies off oh, yeah. the street, probably. Yeah, because oh, Walmart would own all the roads. We forgot about <laughs> all of the, every single road on the planet would be named Walmart Street. So you would. That's another thing. You would never be able to find your way around. It would be like, okay, you need to go to fourteen hundred Walmart Street. It'd be like, <laughs> oh, okay. So you take a left on Walmart Street, drive about <laughs> two miles, take a right on Walmart Street. Drive about two miles, take a right on Walmart Street. I think I think you've derailed us. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just I'm just talking shit now, but you know the, that's the kind of shit that I hear from people, you know, arguing about this. It's absolutely <laughs> ridiculous. I yeah. Uh, so going back to beliefs and real truth. <laughs> I don't know how the hell that happened. Um. Yeah, right. you know what? It would be hard to get around if there all the streets were at Walmart, though. I'd be confused. <laughs> yeah. So I believe that uh, we have uh, beliefs within ourselves, but we need to crack it open. We need to start thinking logically. And I think that I know we don't like having this debate on the show, but when we debate morality, I think that's a smart thing to do um, because. You know, we need to keep an open mind, and that includes myself, of course. I'm not saying otherwise. I'm just saying that if we have the debate, it's a good thing. It's not. An, it, it's. It, we shouldn't be getting uh, frustrated. You know what I'm saying? This. Is, you know, liberty is about finding the truth. You know, it's about finding ourselves. It's about, you know, being ourselves. So, you know, with it, with that, I think we all agree that. Uh, it's moral to be yourself, you know. Anyway, I'm just saying, finding the truth is important, and I, I want to bring that to the show a little bit more, like a little more philosophy here. Um, anyway, um, 
I've also uh, thought, well, you know what, we're almost running out of time. we got about 15 minutes-ish. So I'm going to run through the um, money, the currency analysis or whatever. Um, so last show, uh, we did this uh, October 6th. That was one week ago. Um, I took prices tonight at uh, 840. Uh, silver has gone up from 1736 to 1749. That's a 13 cent change. That's 0.7 uh, percent uh, going up. Gold has gone up uh, from 1206.68 to 1235.50. That's a 28 dollars and 82 cent change. It's a 2.4 percent change. And Bitcoin has also gone up quite dramatically uh, from 1330.70 to 390.41. That's a 59.71 change, 18.1%. 18.1%, yeah. Last time it went down 19.9, so it basically recovered. Bitcoin is pretty volatile. It is, but it's still early. You know, like uh, it just came into existence a couple of years ago, so... Yeah. Anyway, um, yeah, let's uh, end this on a different note. Let's talk about uh, the difference between passivism, assertiveness, and aggressiveness. Um, I think the point of liberty is to assert yourself, but not to go over the top, but not to be a slave either, not to be passive. I think it's to hold your ground, be defensive, but not offensive. Um, I agree with that. Yeah. I mean, it's very simple, but um, I also uh, I think a lot of people think of libertarianism, or, you know, talk about status, really, right now, but a lot of people think of libertarianism in general as pacifist, but it's more like as Ron Paul would say even, he says it's about um, non-interventionism. It's, yeah. But to me, that's just assertiveness. You know, stand your ground, stay, but be friends with everybody. Um, you know, just make well, trades and connections. Okay. Don't aggress. Um, a lot of people, a lot of people can confuse um, assertive with aggressive also. Yeah, like, big um, time. I, I have an example, I, a story I could tell if you'd like to hear it. Yeah. Um, I'll, I'll try to keep it short. Um, last year, uh, there, there was this guy, um, one of my neighbors used to come over for barbecues all the time, and uh, somebody, somebody moved in, and, and my neighbor, he thought this guy was cool. And he asked me if this guy could come over to my house for the barbecue. We used to have barbecues all the time, right? Yeah. And I was like, well, sure, he can come over. You know, you think it's cool? Fine, he can come over. Well, while he, w he was in my house, um, I went in to use the bathroom, and I came out, and I found he was looking through my wallet. And I'm like, what the fuck are you doing, man? You're looking through my wallet. And he's like, oh, no, nothing, man, nothing. I was just looking. I'm like, well, well, too late now, motherfucker. You need to get the fuck out of my house. Put down my wallet and get the fuck out of my house. Mm -hmm. Oh, I wasn't stealing nothing, man. I was just, I was just looking. I don't care. I don't care. It's too late now. Get the fuck out of my house. And then he throws his arms up and he's like, oh, you want to go outside and handle this like a man? I'm like, okay, let's handle this like a man. And I reached behind me, is uh, sitting right by my bed, my fucking 44 Magnum. And I pulled that motherfucker out. I was like, all right, let's handle this like a man. You get the fuck out of my house, or you're gonna die. Oh, you gonna shoot me, bro? You gonna shoot me? Fuck yeah! You better fucking run, dude. So he runs outside. He calls the cops on me. Right. I'm like, all right, he's gone. Put my shit away. Wait for the cops to get here. Cops get here, and I tell them what happened. And the cops like, oh, well, so uh, uh, you mind if we uh, come in and search your apartment, this and that? 
No, you can't come in and search my, my apartment. You accuse me of a crime? You better come back with a warrant. You know? He's like, okay, well, I'll be back. Uh, I guess I'm just going to leave here, and I'll be back in a little while. He never came back. Right. Now, see, some people might say what, what I did was aggressive. To me, no, that's not aggressive at all. That was assertive. Him, you know, feeling that he somehow has a right to, you know, start searching through my wallet in my house while he was here as a guest, right. that is aggressive. Yes. What I did, that was assertive. I was, you know, I was defending my property, and I was running off a, you know, a potential thief. And then, you know, when I first asked him to leave, he refused to leave and threatened me. When he said, oh, you want to handle this like a man, he was threatening, he was threatening violence. I mean, mm -hmm. anyone, anyone knows that. He yeah. was threatening violence. So I was like, oh, oh, you want to threaten me. So let's handle this like a man, like an adult. I'll fucking put a hole in your head, motherfucker. You know? What do you think, Kika? Well, yeah, what do you think of that? I think anybody could handle it in, in any amount of ways. I don't think what you did was you know, wrong, obviously. Um, it's, it's your house, your rules, your wallet. Obviously, don't get in other people's wallets. Um, me, me, personally, I probably would have been a little more confused why my friend was getting into my wallet. I'd have more questions. Um, and then based on but, the, but he based wasn't on my he questions. wasn't my friend though. Oh, okay. He, my bad. he was a guy. He was a guy that my friend invited over. I'd never gotcha. met the guy before. Okay, yeah. My bad. Completely different scenario. I would agree with you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's one hundred percent. But I still would have had questions. <laughs> Oh, I, I got no question. This guy, I've never met him before. He's over at my house, and, you know, he's over for a barbecue, and he's going through my wallet. I have no questions whatsoever, motherfucker. You're looking for money. That's the only reason you would open another man's wallet, and you don't even know him. Yes. The yep. only fucking reason you're looking for... Well, okay, I didn't, I didn't tell the full story, but... There was at least like five times during the night before that happened that he was asking people for money. Oh, wow. Yeah. Well, he also would have been trying to steal your identity as well. Uh, that's, well, he was looking to steal either way it goes. Money or my identity, whatever. But, yeah, but, yeah I, did, um, I didn't say before... There was at least like five times during the night before this happened where he asked me for money, he asked this other guy for money, he asked one of my other neighbors for money. Um, he asked me for money like twice, and I told him I don't have any money. And you give him. <laughs> yeah, so like multiple times I heard him asking people for money. And, mm -hmm. and then I caught him going through my wallet after that, so... At that point, it's pretty fucking obvious why he was going through my wallet. But then he, you know, he he turns around and says, "Oh, I wasn't gonna steal from you." Bullshit, man! You've been asking for money all night, and now you're going through my wallet, and now you're saying you're not stealing. Yeah. What the fuck else would you be doing going through my wallet? I'm not, you know, I'm not brain dead. Come on. So yeah, it, it was good to assert yourself and to hold your ground to know yourself enough that you're doing the right thing and yeah you did you did do the right thing so good yeah. so, but you know uh, when when I did uh, when he did threaten me and I pulled out my 44 magnum uh, and I said okay you want to handle this like man let's do it well I didn't point it at him I didn't take off the safety I didn't cock it nothing I just pulled it I just let him see it and I held it down at my side, you know. So, yeah. you know, I, I, I restrained myself even when I did pull the gun on him. Yeah. So, you know, I, did, I didn't even, I didn't even go, you know, to, I, in my opinion, I didn't even get aggressive at that point. I kept it held at my side. I kept the safety on. My finger was not on the trigger, and it was pointed down at the ground. Well, the, the aggressive yeah. correlation would be as soon as you saw him with your wall 
bullet, put out the gun, point at his face, you know, get ready to shoot, or you would have popped him already, and that would have been that. Like that's yeah. Now that will be aggressive. Yeah, aggressive yeah. can either go just over the top from certain perceptives, or just way over the top. Yeah. <laughs> In, in my opinion, what I did was not aggressive. I don't think it was anyway. You know, no. I, I didn't pull the gun right away. Um, I, I asked him why he was looking through my wallet. He said he was just looking, and I said, well, I don't care why you need to leave. And, okay. and then that's when he, he escalated it by threatening me. And what you know, as soon as he threatened me, that's when I that's when I pulled the gun out and I didn't point it at him. I didn't even take off the safety. I didn't have my finger on trigger, and I said, uh, "Now you're threatening me. Now you really need to leave." You know. But this is a good uh, case of why you need uh, open carry, and not that you should be told, "Hey, you can carry it in the open," but you should be able to carry a gun. You should be. You should allow yourself self-defense, you know, um, yeah. instead of being told um, that, no, this is bad, this is bad, this is okay, this is bad, this is bad, this is bad. You, you know, yeah, there's a laundry list of guns you, you're not allowed. There's a laundry list of um, ways you can carry a gun or carry a knife or whatever um, in whatever state you're in, uh, and it's all irrelevant. Self-defense is priority. That's all that matters. Yeah, and you know, on on that matter, um, if I if I was not allowed to own a gun, uh, this guy, the guy that I'm talking about, who did this, you know, going through my wallet and shit and threatening me, this dude is about twice my size. You know, he's he's a good six inches taller than me, and he's probably got you know fifty pounds of muscle on me. He's a he's a pretty big dude, and he's younger than me. I'm 31. This dude is about 20. You know. Yeah. So in in a regular fight, you know, he's definitely got an advantage on me. That's probably yeah. a majority of the reason why he acted like a dipshit because he's young. Yeah, yeah. He's he's young. He's big. You know, he's uh, confident and all that shit. Well, I guarantee you, with the training that I have, I could have fucking whooped his ass. Uh, I would have probably killed him in a matter of, you know, 30 seconds or something. And I'm not even trying to brag, but, you know, but that's that's the kind of training that I have is, you know, I, I train to kill people, not to, you know, street fight, you know, not to punch people in the head and hope for a knockout. Right. But, but you know, but I also, on top of that, I don't know what kind of training he has. You know, maybe he has similar training that I do. And, you know, he's definitely got an advantage. He's got a height advantage. He's got a reach advantage. He's got a weight advantage. He's got a strength advantage. You know? But you have the knowledge and the experience. Yeah, but, you know, he for all I know, you know, he might have trained since he was five years old. He might have the same knowledge and experience. So, so yeah. although I, I might think that I have this advantage, maybe I don't. Hmm. And, you know, he could just fuck me up too, you know, just as easily as I think I might be able to fuck him up. But, yeah. but the the fucking, uh, the game changer is I'm armed. You know? Right. And that is, what, that is what protects my property against anyone else, you know? I mean, uh, there, there could be a, a 60 year old guy could come and try to rob me and I'd be like, you know, a strong, strong arm robbery. I'd be like, oh, I ain't afraid of him. He's six years old. Well, fuck. For all I know, he's done twenty years in the fucking Navy SEALs, and he's got, you know, although I might be trained in how to do, you know, this or that, he's got experience. He's done it, you know, his whole fucking life. He's killed people with his bare hands countless times. You know? Yeah. That's so. Um fucking advantage on him, but if I got my gun, that's the fucking game changer. Now I can defend myself. Right. But in in um, the point of this, I guess, was uh, assertiveness, aggressiveness, pacifist. I am thinking about um, not just physically. I'm thinking also when doing uh, or 
uh, entertaining debates, um, you know, standing your ground in that sense, you know, knowing your argument, knowing your opponent's argument, knowing yourself, uh, knowing or having the backup of the truth with you, you know, so you get the confidence, but you're not going to, uh, and you're not going to back down, you're, you're going to make the case, you're not going to, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, um, and as far as uh, as far as debates go, um, I will do all three of those things. Uh, <laughs> I, I I will really like um, if if people are if they're being reasonable in their debates, um, you know they're they're actually you know they'll acknowledge the truth. Like if if I prove you wrong. And then you admit you're wrong, and we move on to the next, you know, thing. Then I'm fine with that. You know, I'll I'll be assertive or maybe even passive to a degree, you know, and and try to convert a person to my point of view. Mm -hmm. But if you're just aggressively, you know, using ad hominems and you know calling me names and oh you you know you're just crazy. You're one of those crazy libertarians. Then. I got absolutely no fucking respect for you. Right. And most of the time, I won't even get aggressive and do the same thing back. What I will do, though, is I will troll them. And I will say the most stupid fucking shit you can imagine. And, no, just, just to fucking, you know, just so I can get laughs, you know, when they actually think I'm serious. And I'm saying the, the most idiotic thing you can possibly fucking think of. And they're they're like, oh, look at this guy. He's so stupid. This is what libertarians think. Ha ha. ha. Matter of fact, I've been doing that tonight. And right, right. I I will send you I will send you a link to it. Um, this fucking debate I've been having on on Facebook is fucking hilarious. And I've even told these people like five times. I've told them that I'm trolling. And they still come back, you know, ten minutes mm -hmm. later, they come back saying that I'm serious. And I'm like, okay, you want to keep it going? Let's keep it going. Uh, I don't exactly favor the, an aggressive approach or uh, trolling. Yeah, uh, I mean, for a majority of the you know, experiences I have in debates, kind of for that reason, because as soon as you let down any sort of credibility that you have, regardless of if you're trolling or not, you ruin, in a, in a, in a certain way, any chat person ever seeing your perspective. Um, so I, I, personally, I favor a more passive to assertive um, debate standard. Uh, you know, giving facts, using logic, reason, etc., um, and not, you know, not trying to antagonize the debate or derail it with controlling comments and stuff like that. Uh, so I don't see it as constructive or even productive to either enlighten or bring people into the same perspective. Yeah. I just saw. Uh, I just posted a link on your uh, YouTube page. I mean, not YouTube. Uh, your Facebook, Facebook. page. Yeah, that's, um, that's a link to the debate where I'm trolling these people. And I started it out just for fun, but they kept taking me serious. And after a while, they kept taking me serious, and I admit it. I'm like, okay, guys, I'm trolling. You know, I'm just having fun here trolling. But then, you know, I come back a few minutes later, and they're acting like I'm serious again. I'm like, okay, so I'll troll you a little more. And then later on, I admit it. I'm like, okay, I'm trolling, guys. Okay, you know. And then I come back, and they're saying I'm serious again, and calling me a fucking idiot and this and that. I'm like, okay, I'll troll you some more. Right. And, right. You so know, just, it just creates this uh, weird cycle. I, I get what you're saying, and um, so you don't get anywhere. You're not. Perf um, you, yeah, you're not progressing the debate, as Kika would say, or. I, I like well, those people actually are kind of trying to get anyway. somewhere with conversation. You know, that, that's why I have this rule, for example. Um, I like to you know, see if we can open some minds up. 
You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, that's obviously what the, what this uh, is for. But the, these people, right. I, these people I was talking to, I mean, they're literally they're fucking hopeless, man. Any, uh, <laughs> I got nothing now. <laughs> um, I I guess uh, I'm gonna wrap it up right now. Uh, we're about done here. Uh, you guys want to say anything else here? Uh, I got nothing. No. All right. Yeah. Yeah, sounds good. Um, hey, everybody, thanks for watching. Um, and our next live show will be uh, October 20th, uh, and that's at 9 p.m. Eastern. And um, so, yeah, thanks for watching, and take it easy.